Hey everyone, this is Pete, and welcome back to Atari ST A to Z, a series of short playthroughs of Atari ST games, some of which I grew up with, and some of which are new to me. Today's game is one of the former. It is Airball by Microdeal, developed by a guy called Eddie Sio, Skio, something like that, uh, and with graphics by Pete Lyon, who was quite a prolific artist throughout the 16-bit computer era. He did a lot of stuff for Microdeal in the early days, and then later on he did a lot of stuff for Houston as well. In fact, early on this series we've seen some of his work already on the game Eliminator by Houston. So he's uh, a very talented artist, a very nice use of colour. Um, he was really good at taking full advantage of the, the hardware he had available to him. Now, Airball is an isometric perspective uh, adventure game in which you control an inflatable ball uh, trying to escape a castle. Um, you've been cursed by an evil wizard and uh, he, he turned you into a rubber ball for some reason because he felt like it. What does it actually say on the box? Okay, here's the epic story. Now you're really in trouble, said the evil wizard. I'm turning you into a ball and sending you into a mansion with over 150 rooms. If that sounds easy, I'm telling you it's not. The ball's got a slow puncture and you'll need to jump on a pump to pump it up in some rooms. But take heed. If you pump it up too much, it will burst. In the rooms, you'll have to pick up objects I've left, such as crosses, tins of beans, a Buddha, a dragon statue, a pumpkin, a flask, and also crates that you'll need to get over obstacles. At the end of the maze, there's a spell book that will turn you back into a human again. Sounds easy, you say to the evil wizard. Does it now? Well, I'm putting spikes in the rooms as well. Not just one kind, but different kinds that react differently and killer pads on the floor. You've got no chance of success. Ha ha ha! <laughs> oh, yeah, so that's the uh, the epic story for Airball. Uh, you have been cursed by an evil wizard to be an inflatable ball, which is nice. Um, so this game also got a separately available construction set a little bit later that ran using the ST's gem interface. And that actually also came with its own runtime uh, for the game, so that once you'd created your own levels and stuff for it, you could uh, you could run them without necessarily needing the original Airball game, which was nice. Um, Packaging-wise, this is pretty typical for early era microdeal. We've got a very kind of no-frills manual here that uh, that tells you a bit about how to play the game doesn't actually repeat the story and in fact there's only one page of instructions in there the rest of it is technical support and then German I think yes German Bedienungsanleitung and so on comes on one floppy disk um, and there's also some other interesting bits and pieces in this box here it's uh, a nice little look back at the time period. So we've got a, um, a registration card here where you can uh, join Microdeal's mailing list. The postcode is essential, apparently. Uh, we've also got a little catalogue of Microdeal stuff here. So that's listing some of the stuff they had available. So uh, at the same time as Airball was out, they were selling stuff like Time Bandit, which we've previously seen on this series. Uh, that was £29.95. Uh, they also had some uh, graphics management and music software, uh, sound hardware as well. Um, we may well come across the replay series at some point. That was something that Microdeal had already started at this point. That cost £129.95 at the time. Uh, that came with a cartridge that you plug in the side of the ST and you can recall sampled sounds. But we're getting a little bit off the point. Let's see what else is in there. We've also got this little sort of poster advert type thing showing some of Microdeal's other games at the time. So other things that were available at the time, we've got the uh, official video game of the Karate Kid Part 2, which is quite good as I recall. Shuttle 2, which is a shuttle simulator that I could never get my head around as a kid, but uh, might be worth revisiting at the time. Uh, Pinball Factory, which I was always really interested to try at the time, uh, but never, never had a chance to. Uh, and Electronic Pool, which, uh, well, you're either into pool games or you're not. Anyway, I've babbled on long enough. Let's go and play Airball. Okay, so here we are with Airball. So this is uh, one of the earlier games I remember playing on the Atari ST. Microdeal was uh, kind of a big deal relatively early in the ST's life and there's a lot of real classics that they put out. 
for Ebel is one of those that's quite well known. Uh, Gold Runners, another good one that we'll probably come to at some point. But for today, we have to deal with this game here. So, how do we begin? Get the spellbook. Right, so, this is an isometric perspective game, as I've said. One of the things I was found a little bit confusing about this was that the directions don't necessarily work the way you expect them to. So in a lot of isometric games, pushing up will make you go up and right. But in this one, pushing up makes you go up and left. And so pushing left makes you go down and left. Pushing right makes you go up and right. And pushing down makes you go down and right. So what you have to do in this game is you have to work your way through this mansion with over 150 rooms and find the spell book. And so you have no idea where you're supposed to be going to begin with, you just have to explore. And remember how the controls work. And hope you don't fall into instant death pits like that. Okay, so maybe let's not go that way. Press the fire button to jump, and that's how you get upstairs. And also how you can get up structures like this if you want to. Although that doesn't have any real relevance at the minute. These are pumps like where you start. Um, you can jump on these to increase your uh, pressure gauge at the bottom and get a bit of health back and they also act as checkpoints as well so if I die now I will restart there as we can see so it's a bit like bits like this I always found really difficult because moving diagonally in this game is very hard which well, not really moving diagonally is it because you're, you're moving diagonally normally but you actually have to, in order to move straight up the screen here, you have to push a diagonal direction. Now I found that very difficult. You died. Okay, let's have another go. Now, as you can probably tell already, this is a horrendously difficult game that I've never been very good at, so I'll do my best to show you what it's all about, but uh, I'm not going to guarantee that we will get anywhere. Now we actually have an item there, which you can pick up by pressing the space bar. I'm having real trouble actually getting out of this room. Well, that's one way to do it. So presumably that torch will help us out in a dark room somewhere. Like these. I think these are the dark rooms. Hence the different colour palettes. So I was, oh, clearly some hidden spikes there. So I was never very good at this game as a kid, uh, because it's monstrously difficult. But I did always rather like it, I thought it had a really nice atmosphere about it. Partly through the graphics, partly through that music, which is really catchy. It's well composed and it makes good use of the limitations of the ST sound chip. And I just found the, the sort of threatening atmosphere this game had to be quite interesting. I 
it's, it's not like it's a scary game as such, but it is... It does have a very distinctive atmosphere about it. I was rather liked. But it also used to scare me quite a bit, just because I was... I get really scared by the... Sort of the, the threat of pumping yourself up too much, of, uh, of all the spikes, of all the instant death traps. And your opinion may vary as to whether or not that is actually good game design or not. I'd probably err on the side of not, but... Uh, Yeah, it definitely keeps you on your toes, that's for sure. Itchy nose, excuse me. Seems to be getting that a lot lately. And I really like the way that the different parts of the mansion, they, they actually have a different aesthetic about them as well, despite using the same sort of stone tile set for their walls and floors and stuff different areas have got a very different feel to them so you've got areas that have got like those sort of electric lamps and the the gas lights and all that sort of thing it gives you a nice feeling of oh dear gives you a nice feeling of different parts of the mansion having different landmarks that you can orient yourself by so like here, you can recognise this bit by the clocks and the big staircase we've got here. That big dining table with the death pads on the floor just to fuck you up. Yeah, I know this game may not look like much now, but I feel this is one of the first games where I sort of really saw the potential of the the new 16-bit computers, particularly the improvements in graphics that they offered. So, I mean, as we've, discussed, as we've discussed numerous times, the Atari ST sound chip is not amazing. But this, this game does a really good job of making the most of it. It's got some great compositions that really add to that sense of atmosphere. We've been talking about... I'm going to burst. There we go. Dead. Oh, dear. Really itchy nose. Okay. got a high score that time. So, this game is probably one where it would advantage you to make a map. But since this is just a quick playthrough and I'm not trying to get through the whole thing or anything, we um, we won't worry too much about that for now. Let's just have another little explore and just enjoy ourselves. Because, uh, like I say, this, this game used to scare me a bit as a kid, but I'm actually finding it quite enjoyable now. There's a nice sort of chilled out feeling to the exploration. The only real threats are environmental ones, like so there's no monsters or anything chasing you at any point. So it's just all about navigating your way through the environment. Figuring out how to get different places. How to get to things that are hidden. You'll notice that the collectible items are random as well so sometimes you can leave a room and come back and there will be an item to collect that wasn't there before so that goes for the score items anyway it doesn't it doesn't um it's not true for the the useful items like the torch
but it does mean you can sort of grind up your score to a to a certain degree. Nope, that's not right. There is some means of um, bouncing across those spikes without bursting yourself. I can't remember what the exact technique is there. I just really like the the animation on the ball. I thought I always thought it was really nice. Like as you lose air pressure, that you can actually see it getting flatter. Oh, no, not far enough. I don't believe there's any way of getting extra lives in this either, so... Although you're earning those points as you go through. Uh, that's purely just how many things you've collected rather than... Allowing you to unlock anything. Like extra lives or something like that. Oh no! Spiky things! Okay, let's have a couple more tries. Go. Oh, okay, so there's a dark room. That's what you need the torch for. So you can just about see what's going on in there, but it's very, very dark and may not even show up on video. So, let's go get the torch. Because that seems to be what we had most success with so far. Okay, so let's take that. Fail to get through that gap. Stop for a quick pump. Whee. And continue on our way. Get through the gap. There we go. Quite pixel perfect in places, this game. But like I say, because... You don't have to worry about anything chasing you or anything like that. It's not so much of a problem. But you can actually take the time to position yourself properly and make sure you're in the right place and only jump when you're good and ready. Right, now I don't know if the candle actually offers any benefit over the torch. Aside from making everything go red. Let's have a look up here. I don't think we went this way last time. Oh, that's just another route to where we've been before. Oh dear. Is that a death trap? I think it might be. I don't see a way out. And there's no way of rotating your viewpoint like in uh, other isometric games like Spin Dizzy. So I think we might just have to... There is a way you can kill yourself in this, I think. Can't remember what it is, though. Might just have to wait for the pressure to expire. Yeah, definitely no way out of that pit. <laughs> oh, is there? Because that's like a set of steps coming out of the floor in the middle, isn't it? No. Hmm. 
Okay, well, we shouldn't come this way. <laughs> Just wait for our time to expire. There we go. Now, question is, can I remember where that was? I think I can. It was up here and to the right, wasn't it? So let's go left. So yeah, like I say, this this was a game that I was never quite sure if I really liked when I was a kid, just because I, I, I found it so difficult. The whole sort of getting around and not dying thing, but revisiting it now, I'm actually rather enjoying it. As I say, despite the, the time pressure and the spikes everywhere and the instant death traps and all that, it's kind of quite a nice, fairly chilled feeling about the whole experience. Got loads of points this time. That looks like a place we don't want to fall into. I think we went this... Oh, we can't reach that one. I believe there is, like, a... One of the objects you can pick up somewhere is a crate that you can drop and then stand on. So that's obviously how you get up to that one. thousand points this time. Doing well. One thing I like about the music in this is it seems to be made up of um, numerous phrases and then it sort of almost randomly rearranges them as you're playing. I'm not sure if there's a specific trigger to the different musical phrases or anything like that but yeah, I, I always like that aspect of it. Because it made the music sound a little bit different each time you played. And it was another... Another kind of incentive to keep playing. To hear all the different musical phrases that were on offer. Getting very short on air. Doing an amazing job on the score, though. Yeah, there we go. Pump it up. Right. I think we might have exhausted this direction. Back to the start room. Let's see if there's anything else we can do in this direction.
Alright, can we do anything with these? Oh, no, I can kill myself, though. Ah! Uh, disappointing. Anyway, let's leave that there for now. That was Airball by Microdeal for the Atari ST. Uh, also available for a whole bunch of other platforms. This originally came out on the Dragon 32, I believe, and then got ported to the ST later. The ST version is one of the more well-known ports of it. And like I say, there's an Atari 8-bit version as well that's uh, surprisingly good as well. So, anyway, hope you enjoyed that. I certainly did. As always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please help out the channel by leaving a like or a comment and subscribing. New episodes of Atari A to Z are on Tuesdays and Atari ST A to Z on Thursdays. Check out Atari A to Z .wordpress.com for a full archive. Do please also check out my other projects moegamer.net where I explore Japanese and Japanese inspired games from yesterday and today and videopackgames.wordpress.com which aims to catalogue the small but well-formed library of the Philips G7000 video pack computer, also known as the Magnavox Odyssey 2. You can also support my work on Patreon or buy me a coffee. You can find links to do both down in the video description. Thanks again and I'll see you next time. Thank you.